Do you guys understand the difference between a straight cooling TX valve and a heat pump TX valve, especially for North American installations? If you don't, you're going to learn. And if you do, you might have a bit of a refresher here. We have one of our all-time favorite guests. We got Jamie Kitchen from Danfoss. He is the TXV guru in my mind. He knows everything about TX valves. And he'll tell you it's never the TX valve that fails. It's always something else. Just kidding. So anyway, we're going to go through a heat pump TX valve, why it has a check valve and how it works for reverse flow. And we're going to learn some stuff, guys. This is the HVAC Know It All podcast. I'm your host, Gary McCready. As an HVAC contractor, we need to be insured. And it makes a lot of sense to have the same insurance company look after all our needs. Lambert Insurance Services has been protecting HVAC contractors since 2009. From general liability to workers' comp, bonding, commercial auto, and more, they've got you covered. Call Lambert Insurance Services for a free quote at 801-937-7030. All right, Jamie, welcome back. It's always a pleasure to have you. The audience always loves to hear the sound of your your voice and what you got to say and, and the education that you provide. And today we're going to talk about heat pump TX valves. So ah. we met up at the, the Empower event last week and you showed me one and, and I got a quick video of you talking about it, but it was only a minute or two and it was real quick. So maybe we can go a little bit more in depth on heat pump TX valves and how they operate and, and how a, a TX valve within a heat pump, um, how it's different than straight cooling. Always ready to talk about TX valves, man. <laughs> it's all, hey, it's, as that's you know, because, that's because, that's because according to the audience, it's always the TX valve. That's the problem. Yeah, uh, I know. According to them. Well, it's but funny. They're, they're probably wrong. 99% of the time. Yeah. Well, if you go back to when Seer 13 first came for those that, we don't remember that far back in the mid 2000s, the whole industry changed from pistons to TXVs. And the worst part is these TXVs were not adjustable superheat wise. And so you suddenly had the entire characteristics of how the system operates when you're charging and dealing with ambient temperatures, not to go on a tangent that I'm actually going on. But what ended up happening was people pulled all these TXVs because there just wasn't that background knowledge of, of what to expect. And so as an industry, as a manufacturer, we grossly underestimated how much training and familiarization was going to be required for TXVs. So shame on us, but now here we are almost 20 years later and uh, the industry is a lot better, but again, it can always get better than what it is. Could that be a similar thing to the transition from TXVs to EEVs? Because there's a lot of misunderstanding about those as well. Yeah, because part of that is with an EEV, you can pretty much make it do whatever you want. I mean, yeah. obviously you can't break the laws of thermodynamics, nothing yeah. can. But if you want to have a fixed superheat, if you want superheat to go the opposite direction that you want it to go in, if you want it to go whatever, you can put that in. You know, the trend obviously is to drive superheat down further and further until it's at a minimum. And it's hard to do that with a TXV. You know, having said that, depending on the system, you don't get the increase in efficiency going to an electronic expansion valves a lot of times that we saw going from a piston to a TXV. Going from a piston to a TXV was a massive, massive um, jump in efficiency yeah. and, you know, dehumidification capability and everything else. It kind of decoupled a lot of what was happening with the ambient temperatures outside where your condensing unit is compared to with a piston that basically solely relied on what it was like outside. If the temperature went up, you dumped more refrigerant in the evaporator and your superheat went down. If the temperature went down outside, then you put less refrigerant in the evaporator and your superheat went up. It was the exact opposite of, you know, what we expect with one of these. Yeah. With electronic expansion valve, you do the same thing that you're doing with this, but you just have full digital capability over it. So you can have it fixed. You can have it, you know, go between a certain minimum and maximum. Hey, the sky's the limit. Tighter control because there's so many different steps within that valve, right? There's, it's a much yep. tighter control. But you have to know what you're doing. Oh, of course. Because it's almost like you've got so many choices now and only a couple of them are, you know, the best choice. Um, it's like they say, when you start a rocket, there's 10,000 things that can happen when you first light that fuse, but only one of them is good. 
right? So yeah. it's kind of the same thing. Yeah. Okay. So so let's tackle the the one that you got in your hand there. And sorry for the audience that's watching. I'll, I'll try to get some visuals out on on social media on this and and YouTube as well. Uh, but if you're driving along in your truck, just try to visualize and we'll try to explain it so you guys can understand. Yeah, go on. So the one you have in your hand there, which model is that, Jamie? Okay, well, this is a, our TR6 valve. So this would be something similar to what you would see in a light commercial rooftop unit, six, seven tons and below in residential units that you see. This obviously is an aftermarket version of it. So you have adjustable superheat if you were to buy one of the big manufacturers units and they, they have a, a TXV in it, most of the time it will not have adjustable superheat. Can I, okay, let's, let's stop there for one minute. Sure. So if you buy, if, if you buy a, a coil or whatever from the OEM mm -hmm. and it has one installed already, mm -hmm. why is it fixed? Is it because they don't want you messing around with it? Well, I mean, it all depends on who you ask. Yes, that's part of it. Um, it has been tested in the lab, supposedly, <laughs> I shouldn't say supposedly, but it's been tested in the lab. They have dialed it in so that you have the best uh, reaction to a change in load. 90% of the time, the majority of your TXD adjustment is due to humidity, all right? The amount of humidity in the room, your wet bulb, that's what's going to drive your superheat up and down. So it is fixed. Um, and the second thing is, is that it saves cost. So to put an adjustable superheat in with the spindle and the seals and all that kind of stuff that go in there, right? That's an added cost. And costing of something is very, very big in the, you know, especially residential air conditioning where price competition is very, very important, right? So driving down costs obviously is something that is in formout. So they're not going to pay for something that they don't deem as necessary. So again, fixed superheat valves are very, very popular. And again, very, very price competitive. This is an aftermarket version. So in the aftermarket, you have a little bit of different approach to it. Mm -hmm. You're trying to make it as flexible as possible. Okay. And so costing then is not as important as given the technicians, the service people, something that they can use and apply to multiple different units. So okay. if you need to fine tune it a bit to drive your superheat down, you can do that. It's got a built-in check valve here. So a check valve is what we'll come to when we're talking about heat pumps, a built-in check valve. Well, a manufacturer is not going to pay for that if it's just in a straight air conditioning unit. So what you end up with is for manufacturers, you end up having like a ton of different code numbers. They may look the same and have the same capacity, but they have different code numbers because they're going to put them in different units. So um, you have a myriad of different TXVs, but what the industry is doing as far as parts manufacturer like Danfoss, Borland, everybody else is we've got universal kits where you can put out something like this and you have a bunch of um, adapters. So this is a braze connection. Um, you have chat lift, air equip, flare connectors. You have the insulation tape. That's great for taking all the hairs I say off your arm. And then you for got sure. a bulb strap. And what that allows you to do is, you know, this has got a range of you know, one and a half to two and a half tons, say, for example, or three tons. So any of those units you can replace with a universal valve. So if it's 410A or 22, it's pretty simple. You select a valve based on the refrigerant and the capacity range of the system. So a lot of times you put two or three valves in your truck, right? And you can service just about every air conditioning system out there. The good thing about a TXV is it operates over a wide range, especially in air conditioning. So you can take from like 10 code numbers that you would normally have. I mean, if you look at those OEM specific replacement parts that come in the white box, you'll see like a whole, you know, shelf load of them. Well, you could probably take most of those and replace them with one or two universal kits. Now, is a little bit extra work required? Sure, you got to braze on, you know, one of these adapters that fits into the distributor. But hey, it's a lot easier than driving to the wholesaler to pick up the valve and come all the way back, especially if you live in an urban area where traffic is never fun, you know, and we do, we both live in that kind of area. And and one of the interesting things about the valve you, you have in, in front of you and what you're holding up is the bulb. And at the Empower event there, when you were showing it to me, you said, I don't remember the term you used. It was like, 
uh, special. Oh, yeah, I special... just came up with a name like what yeah. I call it. Uh, yeah, auto cascade. For those that don't know, an auto cascade is where you mix a bunch of refrigerants together in the system, and they all boil off at a different rate. And this causes your evaporator temperature to start way up here and up way down here. So we use it for low temp. So the last refrigerant to boil off is at a very, very low temperature. Where I'm kind of going with that is you can fool around with this bulb mixture. So secret sauce, whatever you want to call that's, it. That's exactly what you called it at the show. Yeah. Secret sauce. That's what I was trying to remember. <laughs> oh, sorry. So you have a secret sauce in that bulb that yes. allows that valve to be used across multiple yes. refrigerants, right? Yeah. Now, air conditioning allows you a lot of flexibility because you don't run your evaporator at minus 20. So in your refrigeration, you know, you have bulb charges designed for very low temperatures or low temperatures. So think ice cream freezers and less where you want to have, you know, the valve open up, reduce your superheat or keep it relatively low um, at low temp. Then you have some that are aimed at medium and high temp. Air conditioning, you don't have to worry about the evaporator temperature. It might be 42 degrees Fahrenheit. It might be 48 degrees Fahrenheit or this associated uh, Celsius scale, but it's not going to be below that. So you can have a bulb mixture that takes into account the profile of the different refrigerants. And so you can have the boil off in here or the, or the vapor release that changes the pressure in the sensing bulb. And this is the only opening force in a TXV. Correct. So this yeah. drives the valve open. So you can fool around with this mixture a lot of times. And we've done it in the past with ice machines, for example, where you have an ice machine charge or a supermarket charge. They're tailored for a specific type of application profile. This is very similar in that you have a bulb mixture that will recreate the pressure scales and temperature scales of the different refrigerants, whether it's 410A, 32, 454B, XYZ, 123, whatever the heck it happens to be. So that the valve opens and closes with a value of superheat that is pretty close between the same refrigerants. In other words, you know, between a 10 degree superheat and a 15 degree superheat, the amount of opening of the valve is going to be very similar. What this allows you to do is take that universal step, you know, or get that universality one step further where, okay, before you had a universal valve for each refrigerant. Now you've got one for multiple refrigerants. Now, obviously we can't do everything. You're not going to have 410A and 134A because they have completely your massive different pressure mm -hmm. temperatures. But yeah. as long as they're relatively close, you can mix and match, as you say, the secret sauce and come up with an opening profile that allows you to use it for multiple refrigerants. Um, so the one again, you're holding there, how many refrigerants can you this get? This is an that old one? valve. This is just 410A. Okay. Okay. So originally the kits were 410A or 22407C, but there again, 22407C are two different refrigerants. One's got glide, one don't, right? So that is going back the same as R134A, 513. All of these refrigerants can be used if you put that mixture together. Keep in mind, this bulb never had just the refrigerant in it it always had a mixture that otherwise what happens if you just have the refrigerant in here the amount of temperature change for pressure now let's think about saturation now so we're going back to our pressure temperature chart it might be great at a higher temperature but as you go to a lower temperature the amount of change in pressure is different in other words, it takes a couple degrees in order to get a certain amount of pressure, whereas it might only take one degree to get a certain amount of change. So the amount of pressure change that happens here with temperature is not fixed. It is different at low temp and high temp. Here's the problem. The spring in here is a dumb spring. It doesn't take any difference in pressure to open and close the valve as far as the spring is concerned. So what ends up happening is the valve either overfeeds or underfeeds at one temperature range. That's what would happen if you had just a single bulb charge. But again, secret sauce, you can mix and match and put things in here that overcomes that. So the valve opens the same amount at low temp as it does at high temp. And so it helps keep that curve straight and accurate across the range. Again, gotcha. air conditioning, we don't worry about that. This is just straight, you know, narrow range of refrigerator or evaporator temperatures it allows you a lot more flexibility and a lot more options when it comes to mixing 
the stuff in the valve here. Let's get to the, the whole heat pump aspect of it and why it's got a check valve in it. If you think back to your days when you used to learn about heat pumps, they tell you the two things that you can't reverse flow in is the compressor. And do you remember the other one? The metering device. <laughs> the TXV, the TX right? valve. Yeah. So that is true in North America. We have a TXV that has direction in one way for the cooling. And then we have another one that is in the opposite direction. Now, here's the thing. In the case of these valves, you can't reverse flow to them, okay? So if you have them in series in the same liquid line, you need some kind of bypass. Now, we call it a check valve because it stops flow. So you can see the arrow here. It's hard to say, but it has that flow. So if the refrigerant comes in this direction, when it reverses, what the check valve does is normally you would have an external check valve. So that check valve would bypass your valve. In other words, it just goes right around it. I was going to ask you that back, like the diagrams that I've seen, um, going through the trade and stuff, it was like TX valve and then an actual piping bypass mm -hmm. around it. You have the bypass external to the valve. In other words, it was an extra couple of steps you had to do. You had to put an elbow in a T, whatever, end the piping, put the check valve in and away you went. Time, materials, effort, whatever you want to call it. It all comes down to money, money and time. What we've done is we've added a built-in check valve or bypass valve or whatever you want to call it. So in the case of this, when the refrigerant has normal flow, this is closed. The when, check valve's closed. Yes, check valve's closed, sorry. When it goes in the opposite direction, the check valve opens and bypasses the metering part. In other words, the orifice and pin and that inside the valve that bypasses that and goes on its merry way. So it literally it passes through the TXV more or less unimpeded without any metering going on. And so this you know, negates the, the requirement to put in an external check valve. So that's why the manufacturers jumped on it because again, it allows them to use a valve for a heat pump without having to do any of the extra elbow work. And anybody in the field, same kind of idea, right? Less chance for leaks, human error, whatever it happens to be. If you can take that out of the picture, it saves time and money and grief and effort, right? So again, part of the universality for the aftermarket service side. Okay, so let's go through the circuit. Okay. Just so people can try to grasp the, the understanding of, of the check valve's purpose. So we have an outdoor unit, we got an indoor unit. The TX valve you're holding is in the indoor unit, let's just say for now. Okay, we're in cooling mode. So that TX valve is gonna operate as normal. It's medium, we're gonna have, yes. yeah, it's, so we're gonna the have- refrigerant's coming and, from the liquid line, it's coming from the exit of, or the outlet of the TXV going into your distributor and it's going through the indoor coil. Yes, in this case, perfect. it's evaporating. It's acting as the evaporator absorbing mm -hmm. heat. That's right. So now when we reverse the cycle and we need to get our refrigerant, now our indoor coils is heating, right? The refrigerant needs to get through that valve in order to get back to the compressor. So what you're saying is there's a check valve in this point in time that doesn't allow, um, refrigerant to go back through the other way. It has to bypass around the actual um, valving. So basically we're not metering. We're just, we're bypassing around the metering portion of the TX, right? Yep. To get back so, to the compressor. Yeah. I mean, obviously a TXV has a massive amount of pressure drop. There's a lot of mm -hmm. resistance across it. That's the whole reason that it yeah. exists, right? So the refrigerant is always going to take the path of least resistance. Think electricity, right? So if you think about parallel circuits and electricity, right, the leg that has a lower resistance is going to get, you know, a higher current flow, more refer, you know, so the bypass here, your check valve has very little pressure drop once it opens up. So when the refrigerant comes backwards through the TXV in the, the non metering direction or opposite the metering direction, it's not going to force itself through the, the orifice of the TXV. It's going to just go quickly through that bypass or check valve on its merry way because it has like, you know, 1% of the pressure drop or something that you would have in the metering device. So it just naturally goes through that. It, you know, it just immediately takes the path of least resistance. Let's just put it that way. 